Greetings, welcome to Epic Chemistry Course. Today, so I'm going to talk about ionic versus molecular bonds. Alright, so if we remember what are ionic and molecular bonds, well, molecular bonds are going to be just simply bonds between um, non metals. So that'll be like a covalent bond. So a covalent bond is just simply called a molecular bond. And that's why we call molecules molecules because there are those elements that are sharing their electrons and so because of their sharing of electrons we call them a molecule because they're non-metals sharing with non-metals so they're going to be called molecules so remember molecules are going just to be um, elements sharing their electrons in a covalent way what about ionic compounds well ionic compounds as we know are metals metals bonded with non metals all right, and so that's ionic. What about molecular? It, as you said, it's just going to be sharing of electrons, all right, between nonmetals. So let's talk about this idea. We need to look at the difference between ionic and molecular, uh, molecular bond. So let's look at the idea and start talking about it. All right. So, if we take an example of um, the differences between them, let's say, for example, we take um, an ionic compound. Let's say salt. So, table salt is just going to be the thing that we use for food. Well, just simply, it's going to be what? Is it an example of ionic or covalent or like molecular? Well, let's judge. We have NaCl. Let's break it down. Na is going to be a metal. So, it's just a metal. Cl it's a non-metal so is that a covalent or an ionic bond you're right it's just going to be ionic because we have metals bonding with non-metals so NaCl is an example of an ionic compound let's take another example let's say um, H2O so is that a covalent or a ionic? Or like, is that a molecule or a, or a compound? Is it like ionic compound or a molecule? Let's break it down. We have a non-metal bonding with a non-metal. Is that a covalent? You're right, it is, because we have non-metals sharing electrons with non-metals. So that will go to that side. So H2O is an example of a molecular compound or a, um, a, a molecule, <laughs> it's going to be an example of a molecule. All right, and so let's take another example. If we want to take another example, let's say, um, let's say we have CH4. CH4, is that a molecule or a compound? Let's see, so we have a non-metal. We have a non-metal and non-metal. Is that, a com is, that a com is that an ionic or a molecular bond? You're right, it's a molecular. So that, mo that compound, that chemical is just going to be a molecule. So let's say, let's write that down. CH4 is part of them. All right, another example. Let's say we have another compound, which is going to be Na. O H. How can we tell? Well, let's break it down. Sodium is a metal. That's for sure. What about hydroxide? Hydroxide is just going to be simply two non-metals together, so that will be a non-metal. So a non-metal, uh, a non-metal, a polyatomic ion here is bonding with a metal. So is that a ionic or a covalent? You're right, it's ionic. So NaOH is part of the ionic bond. So we noticed the difference between ionic and molecular bond. We just distinguished between the elements. But how how do they how do they look like? How how or like how are they different? So let's look at it. Ionic, as you said, is just simply metals or non-metals. And as an example, NaCl. What causes them to be ionic? Or like what causes them to be an ionic bond? Well, simply what causes them to be an ionic bond is the way of electrons movement. So we'll have sodium, it has one valence electron, and chlorine has one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. So chlorine has seven electro valence electrons. How many electrons does it need to have a full octet? Uh, group, uh, group, uh, to have a full octet. You're right, we're missing one electron. So to have that full octet rule, or to have the full valence shell electron, it needs one more electron to do that. And for that to happen, what it will do is that it will bond with sodium, but instead of like taking the electrons, like keeping it in a fair distance between them, what will happen is that it will steal that electron and take it for itself. So it will shift that electron closer to itself more, and in that way, that sodium will uh, will just have a positive charge, will end up with a positive charge, and chlorine will end up with a negative charge, causing that ionic bond to happen. So it's just because the electron is being shifted towards it, and it took it towards it, chlorine just took it towards it, and shifted that electron towards it, so it gave it that negative charge, and sodium gained that positive charge, and because of that, they bonded, and they have... A ionic bond. So simply an ionic bond will always see charges occurring. So it will always have that negative definite charge and a definite positive charge because of the electrons being shifted so close to that non-metal. So remember in ionic compounds we, we call we just call the non-metals always greedy elements. So non-metals in the ionic compounds are always the greedy ones. So they always want that electron closer to them. So that's why they have that negative charge and they will bond. All right, and they'll be ionic. So just because of that greediness of their non-metals. Non what about the molecular bond? Molecular bond is actually way better. So in a molecular bond, if we take an example of water, H2O, what will happen is that we're going to have the bond between hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, you'll have two hydrogens, but let's just look at the uh, this side. So what will happen here is that we'll have the valence electrons. Let's look at it. I'm going to have valence electrons of water, of water, of oxygen and hydrogen here. What will happen here is that we'll have actually a sharing of electrons. So how does that happen? We can just imagine them as um, what's called as, um, let's say here, hands. So we can imagine them as hands. So what will happen here is that they will share electrons. So what happened here is that hydrogen has one electron, so it will put its electron here, and oxygen has one electron, so it will put its electron here. In that total, we'll have two electrons. That will benefit both of them. So they'll keep that, they'll keep that um, what's called electron in a way that it will be sharing almost, so the distance will be almost fair. So what will happen here is that oxygen, in that way, it will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then from the hydrogen atom here again, they will share electrons. What will happen here is that it will have a fair, it will have a full octet rule. It will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And then hydrogen will have one, two, and then it will have one, two electrons. So the distance between them is pretty much almost fair, almost fair. And that this will give a, that will just give the water its uh, full rights that will have that full octet rule each atom will have its full octet rule and they won't gain a charge a definite charge just like ionic so there won't be any charges but when we're looking at covalent compounds we'll always notice that the idea of partial charges and that will have just a partial charge because of the differences in electron activity someone's pulling the electrons a little bit closer to it which is going to be oxygen in this case, so there will be a partial neg negative and partial positive charge that will occur, but that will not just, that will not just um, be definite like the, uh, the ionic. So in covalent, we'll have sharing of electrons, we can see that they're sharing like hands, and in ionic, we'll have just greediness, one element is taking the electron to itself. Alright, so this is all about ionic and molecular bonds, and I hope this is useful.